Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're discussing issues that I've personally wrestled with with regard to the faith, and today we'll discuss the promise of God. Now, it might be unfair to refer to only one promise of God, because God has made many promises, many of them just as, if not more, significant, such as sending Jesus to die for us, or sending the Holy Spirit to help us towards salvation. This promise of God, however, is the big one for many of us, and while many prominent Catholics and Christians in general seem to have forgotten how to talk about this, it really is the most important thing to talk about when it comes to the question of why we should follow God. Also, strangely, it's all over the New Testament, so anybody who reads the Bible should be able to recognize this as one of its major themes. That only makes it even more puzzling that Christian speakers of today so rarely bring it up. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have the strongest comfort, who have fled for refuge to hold fast the hope set before us. Hebrews 6.18 Hope has been set before the early church? What hope? Who serveth as a soldier at any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Speak I these things according to man? Or doth the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or doth he say this indeed for our sakes? For these things are written for our sakes, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and he that thrasheth in hope to receive fruit. 1 Corinthians 9, 7-10 The law of God says that people who work in someone else's service, like Christians, should be paid for their work. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen again. And if Christ be not risen again, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have given testimony against God, that he hath raised up Christ, whom he hath not raised up, if the dead rise not again. For if the dead rise not again, neither is Christ risen again. And if Christ be not risen again, your faith is vain, for you are yet in your sins. Then they also that are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 13-19 If according to man I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what doth it profit me if the dead rise not again? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty two. Verses like these show us that the hope of payment that Christians look forward to involved all of them being resurrected from the dead like Jesus who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present wicked world, according to the will of God and our Father. Galatians 1.4 Once resurrected from the dead, the faithful won't be stuck in this flawed, sinful world, but will be delivered to another. For all things are yours, whether it be Paul, or Apollo, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, for all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 22-23 Because everything belongs properly to God, and he chooses to let his children have them all, the faithful have everything to look forward to in the next world. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and have appointed you that you should go, and should bring forth fruit, and your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it you. John fifteen sixteen. The good works done by the faithful persist, and in time God will give them what they want, even if that time comes only in the next life. In that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. John sixteen twenty six to 27 the relationship between God and the faithful in that life will be so close and generous that intermediaries will no longer be needed. God will give anything to those who ask in that life. So also, you now indeed have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. And in that day you shall not ask me anything. Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it you.
John sixteen twenty two to 23 Because of all of this, the sorrows of this life are temporary for the faithful, and those in heaven are impervious to physical, spiritual, and emotional harm. However, we'll get into this a lot more next time. Next, what is eternal life? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.